I said this before, but I'll say it again. It bears repeating. It's the best church in town. That's right. And just like David said, he goes, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Okay, cool. Just, just checking. <laughs> I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Aren't you glad to be in the house of God? You know, according to the Bible, um, we, we should be spending time with the Lord every day. You know, spending that time in fellowship, spending that time in the Word, spending that time in prayer. And so guess what? When you come in here, you may be, you know, quarter full, half full, three quarters full. But by the time you leave, you'll be overflowing. You know why? When people come together in faith. When people come together in faith. It does something. Things change. And I don't know about you, but if unless you've been living under a rock, um, there's opposition all around us. Not not you know not just you know not the Ukraine. They got, they got lots of anyhow. Uh, you know, not Russia and the Ukraine, not over in Iraq and Iran and all these places. No, all over the planet, there's opposition, and especially in the United States, there's a war going on. And it's not a war of political parties. It's not about a, a donkey or an elephant or red or a blue, a Democrat or Republican. It is a war against... It says principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness in heavenly places. It's a war of light against darkness, of good against evil, against the kingdom of God, against the fallen angels, the, the devil, and darkness. Because the devil wants to deceive, divide, and distract, and that's what's happening in the nation. But thank God for people of light. Thank God for people that are hungry for more of God. I don't know about you, but I am hungry for more. My wife and I, we, we, um, we were so thankful to um, get away and be able to pray with no in interruption, with no uh, agenda other than to receive more from God, to get direction uh, for the upcoming year, and also just to fill up. And thank you for your prayers while we've been gone. Um, and we've been praying for you. And so we know God has some great things already happening and already in store. And did you know that whenever there's movement in God, and if you could just reflect back on yourselves, and there's times when, when there's been movement in your life to move forward, to advance, or, or to find freedom, or discover purpose, there's always been opposition. Right? Always. Always. In fact, there's times in my life that I'm like, you know what? I should just keep sinning because it's way easier. I wasn't pastor at the time, you know. <laughs> but, but it was just easier to sin and do what I wanted to do because the enemy didn't jack with me then because he already had me. He's like, oh, no, I got you. You're good. I don't got to give you any problems. Keep doing what you're doing. But the moment that I got set free from about 11 different things, <laughs> the moment I got set free, it seems like all hell broke loose. I, I mean, I love that people are like, man, I've just been living in the presence of God for like three years. It's been amazing. Mine was like three days. And then it was like pruning, pruning, pruning. And I'm like, Lord, stop pruning. Is there anything left to prune? I'm skin and bones here, Lord. But here's the thing, if I can see the bigger picture and I start to abide in him, if I start to draw near to him, then the pruning doesn't hurt as much and I can see the growth that is necessary from the pruning. Um, <clears throat> so I want to share quite a bit of scripture. Are you guys ready for a lot of scripture this morning? You're going to feel like you're at Bible school this morning, which I think is great. Because, yeah, exactly. I'm going to teach it. Because here's the thing. Um, I love that people only give you two or three scriptures or whatever, and that's good. 
But if you listen to them long enough and intently enough, you'll find out that all the rest of the words they're saying are Scripture. But I want you to know exactly where it is in the Bible. And that's why we've got, you know, sound on right now and video so you can go back and rewind it again or slow it down to the speed so you can hear. Do you like that? Do you like that? So check this out. <clears throat> we know there's an attack. Attack in the spirit, right? But check this out. If you know who you are and you know what's available to you, you won't be moved. I told Pastor Dane about this, and uh, uh, there's a book by this lady named, uh, I don't know if it's Jeannie or Jean Guyon. I don't know if she was French or Canadian or whatever, but it's called Experiencing the Depths of Christ. And I've tried to read that book about four times over the course of the past uh, 20 years or so, 15 years or so. And man, I, I was like, this is not for me. <laughs> like, this is too deep. This is too wordy. This is too something, something. Because like, if you've read one of the, our books, and by the way, if you don't have the book from our founding pastor, His Presence Changes Everything. It is free to you, and we will give it to you today. Just make sure you ask myself or someone, and we will get it to you today. Hello. Uh, and you're going to need it, but even in reading that book, you sometimes you read it like, I need to read that four times because that sentence was so, like, deep. I'm like, what does that even mean, <laughs> right? Like, where was she in the realm of God when she said this? Because it's like, so if you, and I'm like, whoa. You know, like, oh, what is in the world? Well, I'm reading this book uh, on my time away. You know, I get back home, and, and I, uh, actually it was Thursday. The team's up here worshiping. I'm in the back, and I see that book. I go, experience it in the depths of Christ. I've been in this depth all week. This is awesome. I was actually hoping that someone would say, man, you look like Moses when I came because I'm so glow. I know it's not. But, <laughs> but uh, and so I wanted to read it, and I'm reading this book. I just... I didn't plop and drop, but I looked at the chapter titles, and I saw this one, and it says, you know, living inward. I'm like, well, this was written in like in the 40s or 50s, so I know they're not talking about this culture that we live in today, you know, the selfie culture. You know, Instagram was in the Bible. You know that, right? People will be lovers of self more than lovers of God. Selfies, you know, like, oh, check me out. How many followers I got? Well, so I'm reading this, and I'm weeping in there. Thank God that both doors were closed because they would have been like, what's wrong with Pastor Paul? He is a wreck. But I was reading it, and it was talking about living a life unto him. Living a life so inward focused, so spirit focused, that everything around you cannot impact you, cannot touch you. I know that's foreign. That sounds like a dream. Like, you actually don't have more month than money. All your needs are met. And God will literally give you ideas and open opportunities to you to bless you. Big whales, amen? That's, that's a sales talk. So anyhow, I want to encourage you this morning to be strong. Not in yourself, but in the Lord. And I titled this message, if you're taking notes, you can write this down or title it whatever you want. I don't care. Um, but I titled it Abiding in Him. Because that is the key to everything. That's why Jesus came. He came so we could abide in Him, so we could live in that Holy of Holies. The tabernacle was rent, the, the curtain between the Holy of Holies and the outer court. It was ripped from top to bottom. God ripped it. When Jesus gave up his self so we could have fellowship with God. Amen? So we're going to get ready to, you know, your fingers to cramp. Uh, if you're a typer, then type. Ephesians 6.10, I'm going to start off with this. I've got quite a few scriptures right here. Ephesians 6.10 says this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Not in you. Not in how much you read the Bible. Not in how well you pray in the Spirit, but be strong in who? 
and what? Of who? Whose might? So don't be strong in the power of your might, because your might is weak. Ronnie Coleman would say, it's lightweight, baby. Right? He, it's weak. It's easy. Nothing but a peanut to God. Right? And so he's saying, don't, don't rest in your strength. Don't rest in your power. Be strong in God's power, in God's strength. If there's sickness in your body, if there's lack, if there's turmoil, you need to get into God. I'm going somewhere. Put on some of his armor. Put on part of his armor. Whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God that you'll do what? Be able to stand against the wiles. And wiles is a King James word. It just means schemings. You'll be able to stand against the schemings and the strategies of the devil. So let's, let's, talk, let's look at this. You'll be able to stand against the schemings and strategies of the deceiver, the divider, and the distractor. That's who he is. So it's not your spouse. Some of y'all are scared to say amen. It's not your boss. It is your words. But more importantly, it's the enemy. 2 Corinthians 10 says this in verse 4 and 5. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Now, it doesn't mean that you got to get out on the highest peak of Tulsa and start pulling down things like that. It's not it at all. Because it says this. Here's what the stronghold is, the very next, you know, right after that comma. Casting down arguments. Casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So if God's word says it, and it, anything opposes God's word, you got to cast it down. Here's what we know what that means to do. We do what? We smack it down. We smack it down. It tries to raise its ugly head. Smack it down. Right? That was a weak smack. We smack it down. I was like, that ain't hurt nobody. <laughs> My hand didn't even hurt on that one. You got you to gotta smack it down with some force. Like, listen here. This is what the word says, sucker. I don't care what, the, what, what you're saying. I don't care what my feelings are saying. I don't care what my boss is saying. This is what the word says. And until it lines up with the word, I'm standing my ground. I got the whole armor of God. I'm not strong in my ability. I'm strong in the Lord's ability. Now, you're going to have to bear with me if I get excited. I'm trying to stay calm about this, but the word excites me. I can't help but get excited when I read the word. Now, the enemy, he don't want you to get excited about it. In fact, just say, man, this is so boring. No, 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 no. You got to read the word and then let the word read you. Right? So we exalt anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God to bring every thought into captivity. Make it your prisoner. We know that we have anywhere from 50 to 80,000 thoughts a day. That means the person that you, you may think of as the slowest person on the planet, they're still thinking 50,000 thoughts a day. Now, don't be thinking about no person that's slow. You know, okay, that, that's not very nice. No, I'm just kidding. So like myself, if I'm half asleep half the day, I'm still thinking 50,000 thoughts. And based on psychology today, that's a, a magazine and psychologists, they say that 80% of our thoughts are negative. They're slanted toward what's wrong, what can be fixed, and what is going to keep you imprisoned. But this word says that you're supposed to take those 80% of thoughts and imprison them. You need to put them in prison. Lock them up. In the innermost prison, like Paul was locked up in the poop prison, that's where he was. He was in the innermost where the poop was. Not only was he locked up in the poop, I like saying that, um, 
<laughs> Got to keep you attentive. Uh, they also locked up his feet and his hands and the door. And then the door outside the door, and then the door outside that door, and then the door outside the door to door. But isn't it interesting that that's coming up right now, and this next Saturday is the new year of God's calendar, and it's the year of the open door? Some doors are about to fling open for you today, but there's also some doors that you need to slam shut. And it says that the door to slam shut is anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, right? And bring it into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Christ is the anointed one and his anointing. Okay? And so we're smacking those things down. We're shutting the door on those things. Okay? Now check this out. What else do we need to do? I'm, I'm giving you some stuff here. First Peter 5. Verses 8 through 9, be sober, now that means self-controlled, control yourself, right? You know when you're in the restaurant, we were on a plane, as you know, a few weeks back, and there was this little three-year-old on the plane, and she was not self-controlled. And she had some of those enabling parents, like, now let's talk about it, how does that make you feel? I'm like, you need to smack that baby in the booty. So you want more of this? You better self-control yourself, girl. But for all you people that don't like to spank, that's okay. You're just not following the Bible. Oh, my goodness. Just kidding. Just kidding. Not kidding. Sorry, not sorry. No, it doesn't mean just to smack them down and beat them. No, you're not supposed to do that. But you are supposed to give them the word. Now, here's why I'm giving you correction. Because it says, those whom the Lord loves, he corrects. I don't know why I'm going there, but we need to hear it. Okay? Even the teenagers. Well, you know, they're just having a hard time. Hey, you know what? They're just a big teenage baby. And the adults. Well, I'm 70 years old. Well, you're still a baby. Smack it down. Be self-controlled. That's what it says. Be self-controlled. Be vigilant. That word means watchful. Control yourself and be watchful. Why? We're going to hell in a handbasket. Don't you see what's going on? No, no, that's not what it says. What does it say? It says be self-controlled, be watchful because your adversary, the devil, not your spouse, not Joe Biden. He, he may be ruled by the devil, but it ain't Joe Biden and Donald Trump's not Jesus. Okay, let's be real clear. Jesus is Jesus. Okay? But the devil walks around <laughs> Like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's seeking who he can devour. That means he doesn't have access. There's no door open unless you give him access, unless you open the door. How do you open the door? Don't be self-controlled. Don't be watchful. It's so vital that we seek God in this time because the devil is seeking after you. I don't know about you, but I'll, I, I mean, I, I'm thankful for my friends that got my back. Darnell's got my back. Aaron's got my back. Hargrave's got my back. Everybody else in here that I think y'all got my back. I think you do. I hope you do. I'll find out when it comes down to the, the wire and I look back and nobody's there. No, but let me tell you, God's got your back. And so it's saying very clearly here, seek God. Resist the devil. It says resist him on your mental acuity. No, it doesn't say that at all. Resist him. I know those words are small, but that's so you'll read it for yourself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> resist him <laughs> steadfast in the faith. It doesn't say resist him on your own ability. It doesn't say resist him watching more YouTube channel stuff. It doesn't say resist him by calling somebody else to carry the weight for you. Because let me tell you something. You are the one that is responsible for your faith. God says that he has given every person a measure of faith. So it's up to you to grow that faith. It's up to you to develop that faith. Because then when you do, 
you can resist him. Did you know it only takes a mustard seed of faith to resist the devil? It don't take a whole whopping big scoop of it. One little mustard seed will resist the devil and he'll flee from you, it says. You just resist him. It's like a little barking dog. He's like, bah, 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 bah. little chihuahuas, the little hairless ones, you know, the real ugly ones. And, I got, and the enemy, he's like that. He ain't got no hair and he ain't got no teeth. And he's barking at you, nipping at you, and until you scut, get out of here. Maybe boop, you know. I heard this one minister, he was down in uh, uh, Brazil, and he was running. He liked to exercise, so he went out to ran, ran the block. As he was running the block, this little chihuahua came running around after him. And he's running, he was like, it was perfect, right? It was the Lord, he said. <laughs> and he's running, and the chihuahua comes up, and he's like, boop. And the thing went, yep, yep. And then it's kind of. And then he came running around the block. The next time that dog just said, like, hey, you keep going. You're good. You're good. Go ahead. Didn't bother him again. See, that's how the enemy is. He's going to test you to see if you know who you are. He's going to test you to see if this is really on the inside of you. All you have to do is use this word. Well, I don't feel like I got much faith. Your feelings are futile. This word is forever. And this word is what will resist him. Well, I don't really feel like it's, it's working. Well, that means it is working. Amen? So resist him steadfast. That means don't move. Stay strong in your faith. Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Oh, dang. So I'm not the only one? It's so funny that we, like, when we go through something and we have a challenge that, you know, we almost want to one-up the next person. Oh, yeah, that's terrible. But did I tell you the time when I lost my leg? Like, well, why do you have two right now? Oh, you know, no, no, that, that's not the point. Like, you know, <laughs> it's, like, it's like there's something in our fallen nature that wants to one-up, that wants to really, remember, negative thoughts, 80% are negative. But see, it's so funny that when you start talking about the positive and you start talking about the things of God, people get real quiet. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah. Because they don't know what to do with it. Because they, don't, they haven't lived in a place with God. They haven't abided in him. But there's something about when we come together, we get built back up. There's a strength that comes together. And, and, and when you respond, it actually starts to build and strengthen and awaken something inside you. I mean, Aaron's got faith for announcements like nobody's business. <laughs> I mean, he says it. We're like, oh, dang. You better pay attention. It's announcement time. Right? Right? So check this out. 1 Timothy 6.12. This is Paul writing to his mentee, this person he's mentoring who's having a challenging time. He's actually pastoring the church of Ephesus, one of the largest churches of the world. This young kid teenager probably, and he tells him this, hey, it ain't what it looks like, buddy. Here's how, you, here's how you overcome. Here's how you become successful. Fight the good fight of faith. Has anybody been in a fight before? Verbal, physical, maybe. You've been in a verbal fight? Yeah. No fight's good unless you win. Now, if it's a verbal fight with your spouse, it's never good, <laughs> ever, ever. But if you're always in a, uh, the good kind of fights are the fights that you win. Like, man, that was the best fight I've ever been in. I got my butt whipped. No, no, that's not a good fight. See, we love to see the underdog prevail. That's when it's a good fight. Everybody's all Coach Prime, Coach Prime, Colorado. They ain't never heard of Colorado for 20 years. Now suddenly everybody's like, Colorado Buffalo fan, Buff Nation. You know, and they're all this, right? But I love it. I love it because you know what? He's a man of faith. He's a man that has morals and standards and values, and he always magnifies Jesus. Now his other coaches may be cussing up a storm, but he ain't cussing. He's setting a standard. And, and God is looking for people that will set a standard in these days 
that will fight the good fight of faith and lay hold of eternal life to which you were called and have confessed. A good confession. That means you don't go, man, I'm just stretched real thin right now. Man, it's just hard. Is that a good confession? Mm -mm. Man, it's just been tough. That's not a good confession either. Remember, 80% 80 are negative. You have your good fight and your good confession is, you know what? My God causes me to always triumph. I love what Pastor Dana said a few weeks ago, and she said it again this morning. Hell doesn't stand a chance. If you know who you are in him and you're abiding in him, hell doesn't stand a chance against you. Right? And we only got like 20 more scriptures to go, so we're good. We're good. <laughs> Check this out. Check this out. Remember, we're in this challenging time, but I'm giving you scriptures for encouragement, scriptures for you to, con to confess and to, to speak daily, maybe momentarily, every moment. 2 Corinthians 4 in the New Living says this, so we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze or our focus on the things that cannot be seen. The message translation says this, these times we're in are small potatoes compared to the glory that is to come. The small potatoes, it's lightweight, right? For the things that we now see will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. Forever, ever. Forever, ever. Outcast ain't got this, okay? Okay? The Bible got that first. Right? Philip's translation, listen to this. I love this. For we are looking all the time. Let me say that again. We are looking all the time not at the visible things, but at the invisible. What? We're looking at the invisible? How do you do that? You got x-ray glasses? Yes. The Bible. Because what's visible is subject to change. The visible things, listen to this, are transitory. The word transitory means bound to change. It is the invisible things that are really permanent. The invisible things are permanent. It's like this. Um, has anybody drank expired milk before? Yes. Yeah, it's just like Amber's went, like automatically. It's gross. What changed in that milk? The date? Was it the date? Yeah. The time caused it to change. So if you'll be steadfast in the faith, time will cause what you're in to change. If you stay steadfast in the faith with the armor of God on. Man, I'm, I'm trying not to shout, but I can't help it. I just can't help it. Remember, this is the year of the open door. God's already set it up for you. It, it's like, hey, I've got this map for you for this year to be successful. You're going to have opposition. It's about to come, but I'm giving you this key, this cheat code, this hack to bypass some of the things that you're going to be dealing with, and I'm going to make it easier for you, okay? So the door, the open door is critical this year. It's critical. Now, let me show you something. So we know that 5784, AD being, uh, you know, pay, the decade of the mouth, we're supposed to be declaring something. Now, Dillette, that's what we're coming into this year, four. Uh, four, uh, Dillette is the number four numerical value of four, but it also is a door. So pull up Dillette. I, I put it up there for you. Check this out. Doesn't that look like a door? See right in there? But it's also, remember back then they had tents around that time. And imagine that's the tent door being open. Now, you see that little swirly? It's not a hair, you know, like that turns up like that. I kind of like it, you know, Johnny Bravo style or something. 
uh, <laughs> turned up. Um, but the delight that's turned up, that turned up piece is literally considered the ear. And so the ear is making you to draw near an ear to hear this year. I didn't mean for that to rhyme, but it just did. So he's saying if you'll come into the door, if you will come into the presence abiding in him, you'll have an ear to hear what the Lord is saying for you. To where you're not repeating the cycle where I'm doing good for a while and then I mess up. I'm doing good for a while and I mess up. Live in him and you won't mess up. Servants get upset or fearful when they mess up because they don't know what their boss or master is going to do. But a son or daughter does not. The prodigal, you see the story very clearly. He is sitting away from the father, away from what's rightfully his and he already called in his own inheritance and blew it all. And he's sitting there trying to eat pig slop. And he's like, my father's servants even eat better than I am. I'll go back to my father. It, says, it literally says he came to himself. I believe that this year we're coming to ourself, to what God says we are. And when you come to yourself in whom God says you are, then you'll run to the Father. You'll come back to him with a humble heart. See, he was prideful before, but he came to him with a humble heart. He says, but, and he, he's running, but what the, it was so awesome. The Father sees him from afar off and comes running to him. And, you know, he's smelly, he's stinky, he's skinny. And what does the Father do? He takes off his own robe, throws it over him, takes off his ring, puts it on him. Basically, it's like I'm giving you right standing. I'm giving you authority. And that's what God's wanting to do, but you've got to come to him humbly. And who got upset? The religious guy. The other family member. The religious church person. He goes, I haven't even done anything wrong. And I haven't even asked for a goat, yet you're killing the fatted calf? He's like, what I have has always been yours. It's always been yours, guys. But we got to come into the door. And then when you come into the door as a son, you're not going to be uh, afraid to miss it. Because you know he loves you too much to let you. Do you really think that if you spend a time, we, we, we told our, our men, you know, hey, five minutes a day praying in the spirit. Just pray in the spirit five minutes a day. And hopefully you've been doing it at least a couple of times a week. But if you've been doing it every day, you're noticing something different. You should, be noted, you, you should be a lot nicer to your spouse and your kids if you got those. Uh, and if you don't, then I ain't getting no amens from those men. I'm just kidding. Uh, just kidding. Totally kidding. But here's what I'm telling everybody. If you'll just spend the next, this week, spend this week praying five minutes a day, just five minutes a day, just five minutes a day. Oh, man, he's going to start opening up things to you. You're going to start seeing things in a new light. If there's ever been a time to draw near, now is the time to draw near. Remember the delet, the ear? Remember a few weeks ago, the Lord woke me up at uh, uh, 3.13, and I knew it was Revelations. And in that word, remember, it says, he who has an ear to hear. I didn't even know about all this delet stuff until th this week. But he's like, you got to draw near. You can't hear unless you draw near. Because ears to hear, when he's saying that, he's speaking to everybody. But he has an ear. It's about proximity. It's all about proximity. The closer you get, the clearer it is that you will hear. Okay? Close proximity. Hebrews 10.22. Check this out. Let us, say that's us, let us draw near with the true heart. Hmm? What do we do? Draw near, true heart, full assurance of what? Faith. Our hearts are sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You can't draw near unless you've got your conscience clear. 
Say, Lord, for I repent. Get, I want to kick this stuff out, right? There it is. Draw near, true heart. Another verse, 1 Chronicles twenty two nineteen. 19. Now, everybody say now. Now set your heart and your soul. That's mind, will, and emotions. That's what soul is. Now set your heart and your mind, will, and emotions to seek the Lord your God. That means be intentional. Remember, this is the upcoming week for the new year, so this is a great time to be intentional. Set your heart and your mind, will, and emotion to seek the Lord your God, and therefore arise and build the sanctuary of the Lord. He's talking about the church. He's like, when you set your mind, will, and emotion in your heart towards God, then you'll start wanting to build the things of God and bring the presence of God, says the Ark of the Covenant, it's the presence of God and the holy articles of God into the house that is to be built for the name of the Lord. Set your heart and mind to seek God, and the Amplified says this, as vital necessity. I'm telling you, it's a vital necessity to seek him. During this time. Colossians 2 6 amplified. Regulate your lives and conduct yourselves in union with conformity to him. That's not a fun one. As you have received Christ, that means as you have received the anointing, even Jesus the Lord, so walk. Regulate your lives and conduct yourselves. Was it DMX that said, regulators, regulate? Who was that? Was that him? Warren G. Okay, that's even worse. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Sorry. It's time to regulate yourselves. Hey, he shouldn't have known that. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Regulate yourself. Remember, self-control, control yourself. Regulate yourself to what? The anointing. The burden removing, yoke destroying. So if something's binding you, if something is weighing heavily on you, you need to regular say, regulate yourself against that. And conduct yourself in union with and conformity him. Abiding in him. Not my plan, not my agenda, but his. But his. Psalms 27, 8 says this, when you said, seek my face, my heart said, your face I will seek. He said, seek my face. All you got to do is say, okay, your face I will seek. And then start seeking him. Because it also says that if you seek him, guess what? You'll find him. He's longing for you to find him. Just like I said last week, you know, he's hiding here. Behind something. Peekaboo. I see you. See, hide and seek with God's easy. It's like when you play with your three-year-old. If I go out there and say, she's like, look, I made a hammer. I'm like, that's an awesome hammer. And then and then <laughs> Callum goes, look, I've got this. And so I was stirring all the kids up earlier, so. Uh, and they're like, oh, look at this. And then everybody's showing me all their stuff. And if I went to go play hide and seek with them, I mean, they would hide like there in behind the clear gla- glass cage <laughs> or under the seats. Oh, I can't see you. That's how God is. He goes, seek me and you'll find me. He doesn't make it. Or he goes, I've, remember last week, I have hidden things for you. Seek me, call unto me, and I'll show you hidden things. Now, they've been hidden, but I want to reveal them to you. That's what he's saying. So he's going to lead you to these places if you will draw near to him. How do we do that? I'm glad you asked. Let's see what Jesus says about it. Jesus says this in John 15. And here's a great thing. If you don't know where to get into the word for a little while for this week alone, John 14, 15, and 16. Live in those. Live in it. Well, what part? All three. It's so good. So good. Look at this. I'm reading out of the New King James. I'm going to start in verse 7. If, everybody say if. 
if you abide in me, see, now abide means reside. Make your permanent home. Okay? Um, we had a lot of ladies come over Friday. We, that, that's our permanent home. And we're so glad to have you all come over, but we've been there almost 10 months now. But there's still things that aren't settled in yet. There's still things we're getting lined up. Still things, we had a great, wonderful time, and I didn't have to wear a dress or anything. It was cool. Uh, <laughs> I got to say hey for a while, made some coffee, and then I got kicked out. No, I, just did I didn't. I just got away. But they had a great time. And what were they doing? They were in our house abiding till 2 a.m. or whatever time it was. I don't know. That tells you that there's, that's a good place to be. That's a good, that's a good time to hang out and to, and to have fun. Well, how is that? Because you know that there's no set agenda. There's no regulations. It's just coming and being yourself and getting to know other people. Well, abiding is getting to know God. Not your idea of God. Not, oh, well, I need to go, I need to go check something else out because this, you know, this is just really hitting it for me. No, you're not hitting it for him. If you get if you get into this right here. And start listening to him, man, you're gonna, he's going to unfold things. You're going to start having prophetic. Did you know that everybody can prophesy? It doesn't mean you're a prophet, but it says that, you know, pray that you would all prophesy. That means declare future events. He has future events prepared already for you before the foundation of the world was formed. So when you abide in him, you can prophesy. You can declare things. You can see things. Now, don't prophesy out of your flesh because you'll be a flake. See, remember, if you just stay all spirit, 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 you flake up. If you're all word, 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 you dry up. But if your word and spirit, if the spirit and the letter come together, you grow up. And our, our job is to grow up in him. How do we do that? Abide. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you ask what you desire and it will be done for you. You know why? People get off on this sometimes. They're like, oh, well, you can ask whatever you want. Lord, I want a Bentley. Um, well, let, let's focus on paying the PSO bill first. Let's focus on tithes and offerings. Oh, you don't even tithe, and you know, but you want God to bless you with the Bentley? But you're just going to frustrate yourself, and then you're going to wonder why God doesn't say what he, do what he says. It's not God, it's you. You have to live your life according to the kingdom. The only way you can do that is abiding. Because, see, when you abide in him, your desires are really his now. Your desires have become his desires. Therefore, your desires have shifted. Does it mean you can't have things? No, he wants you to have those things. But you want him and his things more than yours. Because everything that you ask of him is to advance his kingdom. It's to grow his kingdom. Now, Bentley, I don't know how that's going to grow his kingdom, but it might because it might be a testimony to someone else, and that's great. But then you're going to have religious people say, oh, you could have blessed so many poor people with that. Well, how much are you blessing them with? So back, 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 back to the spirit. That was just me meddling. I was meddling a little bit. But check this out. Abide in me, abide in you. Ask what you desire. It's done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Do you know what the fruit he's talking about is? It's the fruit of the Spirit. Here's what the fruit of the Spirit is. Love, you're bearing much love. Joy, peace, gentleness, patience, patience, long-suffering. There's nine gifts of the Spirit. It says you're going to bear much fruit. It's not numbers. It's personal. Are you patient? Are you long-suffering? Are you walking in love? Or are you getting your feathers ruffled when something doesn't go your way? This is just all coming out. So just, you know, I'm just flowing with what he's given me over this week. So I may be giving you a fire hose, but it's all good. Listen to it again in bite-sized pieces. Check this out. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. That's disciplined followers. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide. There it is again. Three times. You think he's trying to get a point across? 
Jesus is saying this, guys. Not some popular person on Instagram. Jesus, abide in me. My words abide in you. Abide in my, I've loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. Just as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy would remain in you and your joy would be kind of good. No, full, full. Did you know your car runs better when it's a full tank? Did you know you run better when you have a full tank? Yeah. I'm not talking about full of biscuits and gravy. That's good too, but you want to take a nap. I'm talking about full of joy. You notice it says abide in just these verses five times. Five times. That's grace. There's a grace to abide in him. There's such a grace. You don't have to work at it. You don't have to try. It's already there. All you have to do is say, Lord, I just, I love you. I want to abide in your presence. I thank you that you're here. The moment I call on you, you're here because you've never left me. You've never forsaken me. And then you start thriving because what did we say last week by the Holy Spirit? Abiders are thrivers. If you're not thriving, it's because you're not abiding. Well, why aren't you abiding? You haven't spent time. Well, I've just been busy. Well, then that's why you're not thriving. You want to start thriving? You want to have some peace and joy in your life? Start abiding. Five minutes will do it, I'm telling you. I challenge myself. I'm like, ooh, five minutes. I can do that easy. And so I set it for eight. Because I was like, I was like, I set my timer because I told them. I was like, set your timer. I was like, I'm going to do it too. I set my timer for eight. And, and it kept going off. I'm like, I'm not done yet. Repeat. I just kept hitting repeat. 24 minutes in, I'm like, well, that's kind of good, but let's just keep going. I just turned the timer off. Because, see, when you step over into that flow of him, there's an endless supply. An endless supply. And so you can get as full as you want. And then guess what? You start walking around, it just starts coming out of you. Changes how you see everything. Everything. See, here's the thing. Too often we're abiding in the wrong things. That means you're spending your time abiding in the pressure. Because all you're focusing on is the pressure. All you're focusing on is the attack. All you're focusing on is the problem. That's literally abiding. You're abiding by thinking about it all the time. God says, hey, abide in me. You know what? When you abide in those things, you're on the devil's playground. That's, that's a bad playground. I know playgrounds nowadays are kind of sissified. They got the little squishy things on the ground and the plastic and the pads. If you're a real OG like me, uh, you are playing on metal. Metal, hot metal slides that burn the skin off your backside when you're just like, you know, and you're, it's a concrete playground. Like you probably cracked your head one or two times. You know when they put you on that little spin wheel and the guy runs as hard as he can until they like, go, like they just get slung off. That's what the devil's playground's like, except with glass and broken stuff all over the place. The devil's playground is meant to kill, steal, and destroy. But God's playground is meant to have life, have it abundantly, until it overflows. We need to abide in his playground. We need to come up higher and start thinking like he thinks. How do we do that? We step through the door and abide. It's so easy. This is the year of the open door, and it's going to be open to you many things, and there's things that are going to be shut that you need to shut. Like I told you last week, he's already told me, hey, hey, you're focusing too much on that. You need to put that down. But I was like, Lord, but it's in Benelli M3. <laughs> no. Well, guess what? God's going to get that to me whenever, when it's not my focus anymore, when I don't really care. And then it'll be such a joy. He probably, in fact, you know what's so cool? This is so cool. I love this church. I love our church family. Oh, so good. I love you guys. Paul's such a blessing to me. Paul Rothhammer, he's such a blessing. He goes, hey, Pastor Paul, I've got a really nice gun if you ever want to go shoot. I was like, praise the Lord. That's an answer to prayer. He's already done it. And it's, a much, it's like a Beretta or something. It's some amazing gun. I don't even know. Because if you ever need an excuse to go shoot something, I'm like, okay, what's your number again? No. 
See, when you take your focus off the thing that you want or think you want and focus on him, he's already got somebody, a ram in the thicket, already there for you. It's already there for you. I'm telling you. Abiders or thrivers. Say it with me. Abiders or thrivers. See, your flesh and your soul, they want to cry and complain. Well, it's just hard. I'm just tired. I'm spread so thin. Really? Really? Hmm. Let's see what the Word says about that. <laughs> Let's look at the Word, Nehemiah 8. <clears throat> What's the Word say about that? Now, mind you, this is Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, he's the governor. Ezra's the priest and the scribe. And then the Levites, that's the priest. That'd be y'all because you're the people. Levites, you're a, you're a priest and a king, right? So they taught the people. They said to all the people, this day is holy. He's talking about today, Sunday. This day is holy. It's set apart. It's a holy day. They didn't even know it. They had forgotten. And as they're reading those things, this day is holy to the Lord. Don't mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the Lord or the law. They're like, oh, my gosh, are you kidding me? This is hard. But they said, hold up, hold up. This is the Lord's day. He said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those whom nothing is prepared for this day is holy to the Lord. Don't sorrow for the joy. The joy of who? Not your bank account. Not Netflix. Not Amazon Prime. Paramount Plus. Peacock. I'm trying to think of all the other ones. I don't even know. Hulu. <laughs> There's a bunch more, I'm sure. Max, HBO Max, whatever, Skin of Max. No, blech, blech. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. This day is holy. His joy is your strength. If it's hard and you're whining and complaining, you need to abide in Him because in Him is that joy that is what? Your strength. I gave you an Old Testament example and rewind this video to the New Testament example I gave you earlier. Right? So, like, what are we supposed to do? Well, you know, Jesus is so hard. It's perfect. I'm not Jesus. Hey, do you ever, like, feel like in comparison, like, how am I ever going to live up to Jesus? You ever felt that way before besides me? I got a guy who felt more that way than any of us ever could. His name was James. He was literally the brother of Jesus. Can you imagine Joseph? Man, why can't you be more like your brother? Right? Because you know Mary didn't say nothing. She just kept it in her heart. But James, it says James was the brother of Jesus, and he learned some things. In fact, he didn't even get the revelation until after his brother had been resurrected. It wasn't while he wasn't part of the disciples. He wasn't one of the bros, literally and figuratively. It was after the fact that he got revelation on this. And he learned something by seeing his brother. And it says this, James 1, in verse 2 and 3, it says this, Count it all joy. Remember, joy of the Lord your strength. So count it all joy when you fall into various trials. What? I, no, get behind me, Satan. I don't want no trials. Trials stink. Guess what? You'll keep repeating them until you pass them. And here's how you pass them. Count them joy. Why? Here's what it says. Knowing the testing of whose faith? Your faith. You want to grow up in, in your faith? You want to get some more faith? Count it all joy. You know, when you encounter these trials, the testing of your faith produces patience. But do you know patience? We, nobody likes patience. I mean, we get upset at Chick-fil-A when it takes a long time, right? Where's Uber Eats? How come I ordered that Uber Eats like 
10 minutes ago, and I know it's around the corner, right? No. Here's what it literally means. That word patience in the Greek, perseverance. So the testing of your faith produces perseverance. But see, the longer you hold on to your own way, the only going back to your own way of doing things, the longer you stay there. So, so, so what you need to do is when trials come, when tribulations come, when those kind of things come, you go like this, oh, man. And be like, one joy. <laughs> right? Oh, man, the devil is jacking me up. Man. I can't believe that happened. Two joy. And then, oh, my wife, man, I can't believe she said that to me. And then I got this bill. Three joy. You keep counting it joy. I can't believe they said that to me. You know, I saw this meme the other day. And it said at the Last Supper, if they were making turkey, Jesus would be like, hey, Judas, you want to cut this turkey for me? He said, what? Why Why you want me to do that? Jesus goes, because you're pretty good at stabbing people in the back. <laughs> but no, he didn't do that. Thank God there wasn't turkey at the Last Supper. See, Jesus didn't get in his flesh. It said for the joy that was set before him. The joy that was set before him, he counted it one joy, two joy, three joy, five billion joy. You're the joy. And now that we have him, then we can look at him and he's our joy. You can count it all joy. And the devil knows that if you do that, you can never lose. But see, when the devil, he loves to discourage See, those children of Israel, they made it out of Egypt, but Egypt didn't make it out of them. And the moment something happened, the moment they became discouraged, they lost their strength. Did you know what discouragement in the Hebrew means to break into pieces? Why do you think the devil wants you to get excited about something so then you can just be discouraged? Because he wants to break you into pieces. There's some old grunge rock songs like, cut my life into pieces. Frustration. Okay, anyhow. So, we know the song. But it's so anti-anointing. Basically, you're singing, make me discouraged. Don't cut my life into pieces. That's discouragement. And discouragement is a form of depression. And depression is a spirit. Because it says that where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. That means there's freedom. That means it's not binding you. It's not weighing you down. It's lifting you up. Amen? And so, so during this week, as I was praying, I got some things in prayer, and I wanted to share them with you, just some of them, not all of them. Because we'll be here for a while if I do that. Um, <clears throat> but I kept getting this. A changing of the guard. There's a changing of the guard. That's transition. And then know it now that after, after I got that in prayer, I started studying things out. And I saw this thing about Dillette. About there's an open door. There's things that are going to change. God's calling us up higher. We have to have an ear to hear. And as I was praying, I kept getting this word that was weird to me. Uh, and I'm like, I'm not a medical guy, so why am I getting this? I kept getting intercranial, intercranial, intercranial. I'm like, well, I play the game cranium. We have that board game at home. I'm like, is that it? You know, but I knew, I knew that it, cranial was, had to do with the brain. So I looked up in the medical dictionary of intercranial, and it meant within the mind. There's a changing of the guard within your mind that must happen in order to enter into that place of abiding in him. That means letting go of your old way of doing things, letting go, holding on, let go of that betrayal. I hear that by the Spirit, let go of that betrayal, let go of that discouragement. Because it's keeping you imprisoned and that trouble has been troubling you too long. And this is what I heard the Lord say yesterday. It's time for you to trouble your trouble. 
How do we do that? You trouble your trouble because what that means is you're living a life of faith. You're abiding in him that when you wake up in the morning, the devil's like, oh, dang. They just woke up. What are we going to do today? Because we're on a losing battle. Because you start troubling your trouble, you start declaring the end from the beginning, you start saying what God says about your situation, you can't lose. It's time for you to trouble your trouble. It's time for that changing of the guard. What does it say in Romans 12, 1 and 2? Not to be conformed to the world, but intercranial. <laughs> intercranial changing of the guard. Transform. Be transformed. Metamorphosis. That's literally what the word means in Greek. Be transformed from, from a caterpillar to a butterfly. It ain't no bug's life caterpillar with his little tiny wings. No, it's a full transformation. Never can go back. See, the thing is, what you believe is a lot greater than what you feel. Well, I just don't feel too bad. What do you believe? What do you believe? Well, I know, I know, but shut your butt up. Because you're talking out of your butt. You can take that however you want. I didn't say with two T's. I said it with one. Just to be clear. What you believe is a lot greater than what you feel. The only way to trouble your trouble is by abiding in him. Darnell got it this morning. When you're abiding in him, you're insulated doesn't mean that trouble doesn't come. But what does the word say? It says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord raises a standard against them. But see, they put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. You know what I'm talking about? They put the comma in the wrong place. When the enemy comes like a flood, the Lord raises up a standard against the enemy. It ain't when the enemy comes in and, oh, floods my emotions. Get over it. Don't you think God already knows when the enemy's going to come in? Don't you know he wants to raise you up? They make songs about it. You raise me up. It's more than a song. He wants to raise you up. And how does that happen? Abiding in him. The more I come into him, Lord, I'm in you and you're in me. You'll never leave me nor forsake me. Though the enemy may come at me one way, he's got to flee before me seven. Though a thousand may be at my side, ten thousand fall at my right hand. Because you are with me. Your rod comforts me and strengthens me. It happens from abiding. There's strength in abiding. Your strength comes from the Lord, right? Ephesians 10, 6, 10 says this. Finally. Yeah, I'm about to close. Oh, praise the Lord. Finally. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, right? Right? In conclusion, the Amplified says, be strong in the Lord. Be empowered through your union with him. Be empowered through your union with him. Draw your strength from him. That strength which his boundless might provides. See, that strength doesn't come from you. It comes from the Lord. It comes from abiding in him. If you rely on self or you rely on your feelings, you're going to fail every time. So your feelings don't matter because feelings are really an enemy of faith. Feelings are an enemy of faith. Well, I just don't feel like I need to come to church today. I'm tired. Get your butt to church. Quickly. On time. On time. Oh, I'm not going to make it to church today. I'm sick. That's why you need to come. You need to get healing. That's You know, there's healing in here. 
We have healing here. In fact, if you're going to need healing today, I will, we will lay hands on you and you will recover. That's what the church does. That's who we are. See, the thing about feelings is they lie to you. And feelings, offense will try to get into feelings. And then when offense gets rooted into your feelings, man, the Bible says a, a brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. So you got to make sure that you, you keep your feelings imprisoned. You smack them down, right? Because it takes faith to abide in him. I promise you this morning you didn't wake up going, this is the day that the Lord has made. Maybe some of you did, but I didn't. I woke up like, man, it's early. <laughs> I get up at four. You know, I was like, whew, time for that cold shower. Like, I, I take cold showers. Like, I, I don't put any hot water in. It's all cold. <laughs> it does sound terrible, but it's so good for you. It's awesome. Not only does it wake you up, it does something to your lymphatic system, and it burns fat. So it actually does. Try it out sometime. Cold plunge. <laughs> but it's really good. And so, you know, you have to stir yourself up. It takes faith to abide in him. It takes faith to stir yourself. That's why Paul said, hey, I'm reminded of the giftings, the prophecy that was put over you, the giftings that are inside of you, to stir up the gift of God that's on the inside of you. It's already there, guys. Say, it's in me. It's already there. It's already there. See, you don't have to go find it. It's there. You just got to stir it up. Well, how do you stir it up? Speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, to make a melody in your, not your mind, your heart to the Lord. you got to stir it up. It's already there. Just stir it up. See, the thing about faith is faith has a sound. Doesn't it? She gets it. Faith has a sound. Like, hopefully you've heard it in my voice. You don't hear me going, this is the day. <sighs> Lord's made it. I'm going to rejoice. Be glad in it by God. <laughs> Bless the Lord. Oh, wait. Oh, my soul. Their pastor's here. Oops. Bless the Lord. No, 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 no. There's a sound of faith. Because here's what faith is. Faith is an expectation. Now faith. Now faith. It brings our hopes into reality. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Do I have that up there, Gracie? Thank you. Awesome. Check this out. Passion translation. I'm passionate about it. Uh, now faith. See, faith isn't yesterday's faith. You can't live on what you learned 10 years ago. Bible school. You can't live on the revelation or the joy that you got. Remember the time the Holy Ghost fell and we ah, 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 and we danced and, and I, I shook and I fell out and, man, I could feel his presence. Well, yeah, that was 27 years ago. I can't live off that. I got to live on now. Here's the cool thing about faith. Faith is never in the past. It's always right now and it's for your future. Because faith declares the end from the beginning. Because it's already out there. It's not going to be happening. It's already happening. It's not going to. It already is. Now faith brings our hopes. Hope is confident expectation. Are you confidently expecting to get healed? Are you confidently expecting to receive blessing from the Lord that makes you rich and adds no sorrow to it? Are you confidently expecting to have the best marriage you ever are you confidently expecting for your marriage to be restored, renewed, and better than you ever could have dreamed of? Are you expecting confidently for favor wherever you go, that it opens doors and prepares way and places you before great and mighty men? See, you can hear the faith coming up in me. You can hear the word come because guess what? I'm living in it, and it lives in me. This isn't some show or some put on. It's a now faith. Now faith brings our hopes into reality. Come on, somebody. It's a reality. You cannot tell me 
that I do not live at 17840 South 42nd East Avenue. I'm not telling you the rest of it because you might. Why? It's a reality. It's a reality. Now, according to Amazon, there's a two of dresses like that, and one's completely the opposite of where mine is. But the reality is where I live is where I abide. And where I abide is a reality. It was faith a couple of months ago, but now it's a reality. And not only that, it's the foundation that we built it upon. See, now faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire, come on, come on. Now faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. That's what faith does for you. You've got to live in faith. It's the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. Like you're healing, you may not have manifested that yet in your life, but guess what? You're already healed. You may not have that vision board, all the things that you're believing for, but guess what? It's already done. It's already there. Uh, one of the ladies, you know, as she was leaving, you know, Pastor Daniel was showing around, and she showed her my office. She's like, oh, look at vision board. It's like, oh, that's so cool. And then on my vision board, there's some things that make some people choke. It's like, oh, that's too much. Not to my God. And it's a tool for what God has for us. It's a tool to be a blessing. Like, I'll tell you this right now. The place that we went to, I liked it so much. I'm like, Lord, how can we buy this? Because I want the whole church to come here free of charge. I want them to come here. I want them to be able to get away. I want them to get restored. I want them to get refreshed. I want them to get renewed. I want them to be able to hear you as clearly as we're hearing you right now. Now, I know the God, that God's not just in a building, but when there's an anointing, I'm like, okay, Lord, you're going to give me a plan on how we can make this happen. Because here's what you got to realize. Faith has a sound, and the things that you see are not as they appear. Come on, they're not as they appear. Joshua at Jericho, not as it appeared. Right? That was an instrumental. They had races around that wall. Remember VeggieTales? They're looking over, hey, the tomatoes, what are you doing, guys? It's the time again. No, 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 no. It's not as it appears. Joseph as a slave, not as it appears. He may have been a slave, but he was a king on the inside. He had something abiding on the inside of him, and he abode in that. He abode in him in the dream that God gave him. David and Goliath. Not as it appears. That dude looked like he was going to take them all out. In fact, he defied the armies of God day and night. We talked about that last week. How about Elisha and the Syrians? That dude was sleeping. He was so peaceful in the presence of God, he's asleep. His own assistant had to wake up. Oh, 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 oh uh, uh, Mr. Elisha, Elisha, what? look at, we're surrounded. By Syrians. He goes, oh, it ain't what it looks like. There's greater that's surrounding them that's surrounding you. It's not what it looks like. Say it with me. It's not what it looks like. See, faith is the eye that sees the invisible. It's the ear that hears the inaudible. Come on now. It's the hand that grabs the intangible. That's what faith does. It's the eye that sees the invisible, the ear that hears the inaudible, the hand that grabs the intangible. Faith is the power that brings the supernatural into the natural. And that's something that you can live and walk in every day. It's not an ethereal theory. It's a reality. It's a reality. Why is this so important? Well, if you're living from the external all the time, you're never going to walk in faith. You got to live towards. You got to live inwardly. Because when you live inwardly, then hope arises. Who keeps hope alive? He does. You keep hope alive. You keep hope alive. Right? From the beginning to end, 
Your word never fails. Come on. It's reciprocal. I was looking through things in Hebrew, and I heard the word sevenfold. And as I was looking up sevenfold, do you know what sevenfold means? Remember how it says that he's got to pay you back sevenfold? Sevenfold means a continual supply. When you're in faith, there's a continual supply coming your way. Healing, restoration, favor. How, I would love a continual supply of favor. I love a one minister that says, favor ain't fair, but it looks good on me. Right? It ain't fair. Favor's not fair. People that don't qualify get qualified. Right? So, so the closer you are to him, and in closing, I know it's my second close, so um, I've got one more. That's right. That's right. In closing, I want you to do this. I want you to make a, a, a determination in your heart to spend that time abiding in him. Spend just five minutes a day praying in the Holy Spirit. Just pray in the Holy Spirit five minutes a day. I promise you your life will be different. It will be changed. And, and as I was praying this week, I was reminded of the, the ten virgins with the oil. Remember the story Jesus told? There were five foolish and five wise. The five foolish, they all had anointing oil. The oil is reference to the anointing. They all had the anointing, but ten of them stayed full and brought that extra supply. Don't live day to day. you got to live full because you know what? There's people that need what you carry. There's people that need, there's going to be a sign you're going to see outside next week as you leave it. It's going to say, go and be an encounter to someone else. You need to carry that full supply of his presence, that full supply of abiding in him. And when you do, man, people are going to help. They're like, what's wrong, man? There's something about you. Something about you. Don't do your own thing. Abide in him. Make his heart your home. The worship team, come on up. Come on up. You know, I don't know where the times went, but it feels like I've only talked about 15 minutes, but it looks like a little longer, but that's okay. See, I want you to live your life of faith. I want you to be able to believe for the impossible. I want you to come into this new year that God has in store for us with an expectation like this is the year of the open door of my life. Open door of opportunities, open doors of restoration, open doors of freedom, and shutting the doors that the enemy has gotten in from in the past. Amen? Because things are not what...